All right, everybody, let's get started. Sign in sheet passed around. Um, I thought I would give you a, a brief sort of status update, if you will, on the class, just so that everybody is aware of, you know, where we're at in terms of grades and whatnot. And I'm doing the same thing in steel, I hear in a little bit. So the attendance grade is up to date on Blackboard, uh, obviously other than today, because, you know, I can't report that, you know, before him. Um, homework number one, graded and returned. You all have the solution post online. Same thing with homework two. Homework three, I'm literally handing back right now. Um, let's see. Hey, come here. Oh, wait, I don't have to walk back. I'm being lazy. <laughs> okay. Um, it, the rest of you, uh, if you uh, come in a couple minutes, I'll just give you your homework uh, at the end. Um, homework number three, graded and returned. Uh, TA is still working on homework number four, uh, but uh, you all have the solution for that. Now what about homework five? Homework five is new, caught off the presses today. Uh, that is due on March 11th. Um, that might seem like a little ways from now, but I'll go ahead and tell you this assignment has four problems, but it's a little long. Um, the, the problems are kind of, yeah. I don't want to say involved, but T-beams and W reinforced beams tend to be a little bit longer, so just, just be aware of that. Um, I'm actually going to pull up the assignment to show you. So there's four problems. The first two you can probably do right now. Um, the, they're, they're two T-beams. I know you're like, that doesn't look like a T-beam, Dr. Mike. Yeah, but you could slice, slice, and, and that's a T-beam. So, um, so I have this section and this section both treated as T-beams. Um, these are analysis, just determine the... Um, uh, just determine PMN and verify ACI requirements. Both of them have 3 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. Um, so determine PMN for both of those. Uh, problem three is a full-blown T-beam design problem, which means determine the amount of steel that goes into it. So um, you need to determine the amount of steel reinforcement for the T-beam system shown. Um, put your uh, reinforcement in a single layer. Don't use double layers or two layers of steel. 3 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. Um, it's a 200 PSF live load, and if you remember from live load reduction, uh, you don't reduce in most cases if your live load is over 100. And so the, the, since this is 200 PSF, no live load reduction. Um, you do have to compute the self weight of the beam, okay? And that we might discuss that a little bit today, but to, you, to determine the self weight of the beam, you use the tributary width, not the effective flange width. So those might be different dimensions. So. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and problem four, we haven't talked about this yet. That's going to take a little bit. This is a doubly reinforced section, so you can't do that now. But probably after today, you might be able to do the first three. I don't know. But this one's going to take a little bit. This is when you have steel not only in the tensile region, but in the compressive region uh, as well. And you need to determine BMN for that. Sound good? All right. So it's been a while since we've... Um, had lecture, so because we had our you know exam review and then our celebration on Wednesday, so I want to maybe take maybe go back a few slides and let's um, sort of talk about you know T beams and make sure that everybody's sort of remembering what we're after here. Oh goodness, and shut up. All right, so we're looking at uh, you know floor systems where we're considering. You know, instead, you know, before when we looked at rectangular, singly reinforced beams and we looked at slabs, we sort of treated them separately. We said, okay, here's a beam and here's a slab. Well, what if it's all one big monolithic system, right? What if the T-beam or what if the slab and the beam are all cast monolithically so that when the concrete cures, it's all one solid chunk, okay? Well, when you're analyzing the floor system, I mean, you can design the slab, you know, uh, accordingly. When you're looking at the beam, because it's all one solid chunk, because it's all one monolithic section, you can actually treat that as a T-shaped cross-section. You know, we have, the, um, uh, we have not only the rectangular portion, the, the web, if you will, but we also have this portion of the slab that can act as a flange for the beam. Um, there are two 
iffy issues to deal with. So the first being that you have to ask yourself how much of the slab is effective in resisting load for the beam. Okay, so <coughs> you know we can compute that very very easily. Okay, and that's just a pretty plug and chug formula. Now I gave I, I dropped a hint on problem number three, and I kind of want to explain that. Um, Visually, so let's say I have a, a, a floor system. Something like that. That's, that's good. And let's say for the sake of discussion that we're looking at this beam. Okay? I do want you to recognize that there is a difference between the tributary width and the effective flange width. Okay? So the tributary width is literally just halfway over, right? So we call this dimension here the tributary width or WT is the same thing as the girder spacing. Um, now remember that is a different quantity than the effective flange width. The effective flange width is how much of that beam we slice out to consider effective in resisting load. So this, so this would be B effective. Now it is possible that they are in fact the same dimension, but they may not be. Okay? What might happen is what we have here on the board. You might have a different effective flange width than you do a tributary width. Okay, so for instance, here's where it becomes important. Okay, so if I'm looking at, let's say, this beam over here on the right, that may be the effective flange width. And maybe this beam here on the right, that's the effective flange width. So when I'm computing capacity, I'm looking at those shaded regions. Okay, but when I'm looking at load, in other words, how much load is this beam responsible for? Well, not only does it have to hold up its own self-weight, but it's also got to hold up this little piece of slab as well, right? Because this little piece of slab here isn't, you know, floating out in space, right? So there is a difference between the, the uh, value that you use uh, to determine the section's strength and the value that you use to determine the load, right? So, in other words, when you're determining the self-weight, I mean, how do we determine the self-weight? We say gamma C times the area, right? But when you're computing this area, you don't use this width, you use this one. Because what you're trying to do is determine the amount of force that the beam has to hold up. Does that make sense? So I know that seems like I'm, I'm, I'm splitting hairs, and it very well may be if the tributary width just happens to equal the effective flange width. Because that is possible. The effective flange width could equal S. But it might not. Okay? So I'm just throwing that out there. In fact, I put that on the homework assignment for problem three that said when computing the self-weight, make sure that you use the, the tributary width, not the effective flange width. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now that, that's, that's the, the easier part, if you will, with T-beams. The harder part is this, is, is uh, looking at the stress block, right? Remember, um, <clears throat> when you're analyzing a reinforced concrete beam, I don't care if it's rectangular, if it's a T-beam, a triangle, if it looks like Mickey Mouse, if it's circular, it doesn't matter, okay? You're going to develop a tensile force in your rebar, and that must be, uh, you know, counteracted by some compressive force. Now, for a section like this, that's a compressive force in the concrete. When we look at doubly reinforced sections, we'll have a compressive force in the concrete and in the upper layer of steel. That's a discussion for another day. Um, but right now, so for a section like this, we'll get a tensile force of ASFY, and our compressive force will be 0.85 FC prime times whatever the area of the stress block is. So because of that, we actually have two different cases that we have to deal with. Is our stress block rectangular in nature, or is it a T-shape? Okay, and that's the difference between a rectangular T-beam and a true T-beam. Okay, and we did two examples looking at that very situation. We had one that was a rectangular cross-section 
uh, and one that was a true cross section. Uh, and, and I think uh, it might have been a while since we looked at this, but if you recall, the way that you compute MN is vastly different because if you have a, T, a true T-beam, you have to split it up into your flange steel couple and your web steel couple. There's a lot more going on, right? So, so you gotta, you kind of have to, to take care to ensure that your, your analysis is done appropriately, and then that leads into design. So how do you, how do you design a T-beam? Well, one of the first things I want to answer is whether or not T-beam design is an unknown cross-section design or a known cross-section design. Okay, let's go back to rectangular beams, right? With rectangular beams, we had um, an unknown cross-section design problem where we didn't have a clue at all what the beam looked like. So we had to figure out how wide it was going to be, we had to figure out how deep it was going to be, and then figure out the amount of steel and then go back and check it. There was a lot more going on. We had to guess a reinforcement ratio, like there was a lot to that, right? Whereas with a known cross-section, the, the problem's a lot simpler, it's a lot shorter, um, and ultimately if you're a little bit more scientific about it, you're not just picking a row value out of the sky, you're actually solving for the amount of steel that you need in order to safely resist those loads. Well, with T-beam design, we would like to be able to treat it like that. We'd like to be able to treat it as a known cross-section design problem because there'd be a lot less stuff to deal with. And can we? Short answer is yes, you can. Because hey, here's the idea. Can I design an unknown rectangular beam? Yeah, we've done that. Can I design a slab? Yeah, we've done that. Well, there you go, right? So if you can design each of those independently, you can analytically treat it as a known cross-section problem. The only thing that you would need to do is figure out how much steel goes into it. And so when we do TV design in here, we're going to treat it as a known cross-section problem. In other words, you'll get the floor system. You'll know what the floor system looks like, and your job is just to figure out how much steel goes into it. But when I say all that, that's it, well, T-beam design can be a little involved. It's, it's a, a little bit um, intricate, and, and you're going to see why here in a second. Okay? Now, oh, again, we have two different cases for a rectangular, or for, for a T-beam. That's whether or not it's a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam. Now, we haven't quite specified it this way with this sort of inequality, but, but I kind of want to do that. So, one of the ways that you can tell whether or not you're dealing with a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam is a comparison between A and H sub F. Okay, so H sub F is the slab thickness, the thickness of the top flange, hence H sub F, and A is the depth of your stress block. In other words, from the tippy-tippy top of the beam down to the bottom of your stress block. That's what A is. Regardless of if it was a triangular cross-section, or a rectangular cross-section, a T-beam, what have you. We can compare A and H sub F, and I'll tell you directly whether or not you're dealing with a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam, okay? Because if A is greater than H sub F, what that means is your stress block goes into the web and it looks like the image down below, a true T-beam. And so we'll use that comparison to be able to, or we'll use that to figure out what case we're dealing with in design mode, okay? Now, if we're dealing with a rectangular cross-section, it's really easy because all you have to do is solve that expression. AS is rho BD, pick a reinforcement pattern. You're done. Okay? The, the tricky part is if it's not a rectangular T-beam, if it's a true T-beam. Okay? What we'll do in design mode is we'll start out always assuming that it is rectangular. So we'll start out assuming that. So we'll use this reinforcement ratio, and then we'll compute, uh, uh, so we'll use this formula to compute a reinforcement ratio. Now I want to show you what we're going to do on the next slide, so, so bear with me. Now if you have a rectangular cross-section, what's the formula we use for A? What is it? AS FY over 0.85 FC prime B. That's the formula we've been using so far, right? Now, what is, what is AS? Well, isn't it rho BD? Because isn't that how we define a reinforcement ratio, the area of steel divided by BD? It's sort of like about how much steel you have divided by how much concrete you have. So what I'll do is I'll take this, 
and I'll replace it with rho BD. Right? And then the B's cancel. So I'm left with that formula, right? So here's what we're going to do, okay? What we're going to say is this, all right? We're going to assume that the beam <coughs> is rectangular. Then we're going to say, all right, let's say the beam is rectangular. Here's how much reinforcement you need. Then we'll go back and say, well, if you put that much reinforcement in the beam, what's A, right? So we assume that the beam is rectangular, and then we immediately check that assumption by looking at A. Now, if A is less than HF, then our assumption is correct because the stress block it will in fact be rectangular. All right? But if not, then we have a true T-beam and the math gets a little bit more involved. Okay? But is everybody kind of okay with the method so far? All right. Let's talk about the method if in fact we have a true T-beam. Now I want to take some time and digest what's going on on this slide. Okay, what I have here is a true T-beam, and if you look what I have, I've taken this true T-beam, and I've split it up into these two couples, right? And these two couples were how we analyzed that T-beam last week, right? Remember we said that the, um, oh, I'm running out of board space, but remember how we said that the nominal capacity was going to equal the nominal capacity from the flange couple plus the nominal capacity from the web couple? Remember that? All right, so let's, let's take a look at what we got here. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at each of those couples individually, okay? But I'm going to look at them with a very, very specific goal, okay? Now, I'm in design mode, okay? If I'm designing this T-beam, what do I ultimately want? Like, what am I ultimately trying to design? What am I ultimately, tr ultimately trying to select? Size of what? Remember, this is a known cross-section problem. We need to know how much steel we're putting into it, right? That's what we're after, right? So what I propose is what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and say, okay, the total amount of steel is going to be however much steel we need for this plus however much steel we need for that. And so we're going to treat each couple independently, and that's how we're going to figure this out, okay? Now, how's that going to work? Well, let's look at our expressions. Do we recognize these formulas? We did that in our last example, right? So we have the nominal capacity of the flange couple. And so how do we do that? How do we do nominal capacities across the board? It's a force times a moment arm, right? So the force, we use C sub F, right? So C sub F times the moment arm, D minus HF over 2, and then what was C sub F? It was 0.85 FC prime times the area of those two boxes. The thickness H sub F times the total width, which was B minus BW, right? Now what about for the web couple? 0.85 FC prime AB, but the B in this case is the B of the web, and then the moment arm D minus A over 2, all right? Now, I'm, I'm sort of summarizing this, but keep in mind, we already derived this stuff ourselves last week, right? So is everybody kind of remembering this? So if you look at these two terms, right, notice how this one up top does not have an A in it, right? There's no A there. And remember, A is dependent on how much steel we put in it, right? So... Remember how I said we're going to treat these separately? What we're going to do is we're going to start by figuring out what's going on with the flange couple, and then we'll back calculate how much steel we need for the web couple. Because the flange couple doesn't have anything to do, that, that expression for capacity has absolutely nothing to do with how much steel we put in it. Look at that expression for MNF, 0.85 FC prime, that's the, the capacity of the concrete, B and BW, that's the width of your uh, flanges, H sub F is the thickness of your flange, D minus HF over 2. Nothing in, in there has anything to do with how much steel we put into it. 
The only thing that's halfway related is the term D, and all D tells us is where we're putting it. We tend to know where we're putting it, it's just a matter of how much. The MNW, however, is related to the amount of steel. So for each of those couples, what we'll do is solve for how much steel we need, add them up, and pick a steel pattern accordingly. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Okay? For the flange couple, how we do that is we set C equals T, and we solve for how much steel we need for that couple. So the compressive force is 0.85 FC prime times that area, and that's got to equal the area of steel times Fy, again, the area of steel for that couple, solve for A sub F. For the web couple, all we have to do is say, how much remaining capacity do we need? Solve accordingly. All right. So I want to walk through the step-by-step -step process, and then we're going to do a couple of examples. All right. So, here's the design process for a T-beam. Now, it looks like there's a lot of steps, but some of the steps we end up skipping depending upon what happens. So the first thing that we do is we compute MU, the factor of moments on the beam, we've got to know what we're designing for. Now remember, this is a known cross-section problem, so we don't need to assume the self-weight of the beam because we can figure that out. All right? <coughs> now, we assume phi equals 0.9. That is an assumption because we have to go back and check that. We have to make sure that the steel that we provide, that we get a strain larger than that strain limit. Okay? That's an assumption that we fix it or we check at the very, 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 very end. Step three, what we do is we assume it is a rectangular T-beam. When I say I assume that the neutral axis is in the plane, that's what I'm talking about. We're assuming that it's a rectangular T-beam. We calculate our row, and then we immediately plug that row back in to see what, if we provided that much steel, would it be rectangular or not. If it is a rectangular beam, we keep on trucking. If not, we skip a few steps and go on to step eight. Okay, so we're not having to do all of this for every problem. Does that, that make sense? So if we have a rectangular T-beam, what we do is we just say AS is row BD, pick a steel pattern, verify your ACI requirements, verify the fee equals 0.9, that's it. Gets, problem gets real short real quick. However, if you have a true T-beam, a little bit more to it. So a true T-beam, what we do is we say, okay, let's compute the area of steel that we need for the flange couple. So it's just setting C equals T and solving for the area. Then compute the moment capacity. Then we say, all right, I determine how much MN we needed, right? I determine how much MN we needed. I can figure this out. So how do I figure this out? Just divide, right? So... Let me show you how where this formula comes from, because I know it looks like a little bit magic, but, but it's really not. So let me show you. So MN is MNF plus MNW, right? So that means VMN is PMF, PMNF, plus phi MNW, right? When you're in design mode, set back equal to MU. We know that, we know that, we don't know this. So MU minus phi MNF divided by phi. Just output. So, same thing. So, is that okay? Again, we solve for the flange couple first because the flange couple has absolutely nothing to do with A, right? It, it, it's something we can solve for by just looking at the beam directly. <coughs> now that we've got MNW, figure out the amount of steel that we need using the same expression that we developed before. Just make sure you use BW here and the required nominal moment capacity, and then AS is row BD. Add them up, pick a steel pattern, and analyze. It, it, it's that simple. I know that that was a lot of talking, but it's been a while since we've, we've looked at this stuff. So, any questions? All right, let's do this for real. Let's
Let's look at a problem. Okay, so I have a floor system here that I want to design the um, that I want to design the reinforcement for. Now, just so you're aware, I know that some of these numbers might be a little small for the folks in the back, which is why I put this here. So I have a floor system where the beams are spaced 10 foot on center. Um, the, rec the stem of the webs, the webs themselves are 12 inches wide. So B sub W is 12 inches, but B, the effective flange width, I have no idea what that is. Okay. Now I got a four inch thick slab or a four inch thick flange. Um, the total height of the beam is 21 inches and the depth, the D value uh, from the top of the beam to the, uh, where the steel is located is 18 inches. I got four KSI concrete, I got 60 KSI steel. The beams or the floor system itself is 20 foot long. So imagine, you know, here's the screen and it's coming out 20 foot. That's how long it is. Um, <coughs> Instead of providing a pressure load, we'll just say it's got one kip per foot in dead load that's been superimposed on top, two kips per foot in live load. So these beams are seeing three loads. They're seeing a dead load, they're seeing a live load, and they're seeing their own self-weight. Okay? Now it's all distributed loads on a simple, simple span, so we can just say WL squared over 8. Uh, that's fine, uh, but, but, uh, uh, but we will have to account for the self-weight. Everybody's copying some of this stuff down to me. Alright. Everybody good? Okay. FC prime is 4 KSI. We know that FY is 60 KSI. We know that our span length is 20 foot. And we know that our dead load that's superimposed is 1 kip per foot. And our live load is 2 kips per foot. Right? And those are our system parameters. Sound good? All right, so let's just go through this step by step, okay? The first step always in a design problem is to determine the factored moment capacity. In other words, we need, or factored moment, not moment capacity. So compute MU. So again, always the way to think about this is MU is what you're designing for. Right? You've got you to know where you're, what you're designing for at the very beginning. Then you can figure out what you need to supply in order to meet that demand. So you sort of think of this in economics. All right. Now, I want to be clear, again, and this is what I had mentioned earlier, that there is a difference between the tributary width which is W sub T. What is the tributary width for these beams? 10 feet, or maybe we'll say 120 inches. But there is a difference between the tributary width and the effective flange width, okay? So that's this term B, which is computed as the minimum of L over 4, what is it? BW plus 16HF and then the girder spacing. Alright, so how long are these beams? BW plus 16HF and then this and the girder spacing. Now, how, how long are they again? 20 feet. 
20 feet or keep in mind you're going to compare 20 feet with BW and HF which are in inches. So go ahead and take the chance right now to say that this is 20 feet divided by 4 but multiply that by 12 inches per foot. Get everything in consistent units. Okay. Next one, this is 10 inches, or no, sorry, 12 inches. I think I said 10 inches earlier. 16 times 4 inches. And then S is our girder spacing, and that's what, 10 feet? Again, 10 feet. But again, 12 inches per foot. I'm telling you, I think concrete design more than steel design is a little bit, I don't want to say funkier when it comes to the units, but you've got to be consistent when it comes to your units. So up top, 20 over 4 is 5, 5 times 12 is 60. Um, bottom, 10 times 12, that's 120. And then... What is that? Uh, 16 times 4 is 64 plus 12 is 76. Did I do that right? So that's 60 inches. So there's a difference on this problem between the tributary width and the effective flange width, right? When I'm talking about how strong this beam is, I can only use 60 inches, but how much does it have to hold up? It has to hold up 120 inches. In other words, there's a little bit of slab out here and out here that doesn't help this beam strength, but it has to physically hold up the load, right? There is a difference between those two. So, does that make sense? Okay. So, reason I mention that is because if we're trying to say that the self-weight is gamma times the area, we'll call this gross area. I'm going to throw a little bit of steel terminology in there, like gross area and net area. So what is our gross area? Somebody tell me what the gross area of the T-beam is. Recognizing that what we're talking about is the gross area of all of that, where that dimension is the tributary width. But help me out. What's what's the formula going to be? Maybe what we do is yeah, okay. All right. So let's split it up. Let's do the top and the bottom. So, times HF. There we go. So WT times HF plus, plus BW times B. H minus HF. Yeah. Exactly right. Does that make sense? And again, you're like it's tempting to use B here because you're like, oh, I just need to compute the area of that. No. Use the tributary width because of what you're using this for. You're using it to determine how much weight this beam is responsible for, how much uh, load it has to hold up. This is, let's see, 120 inches times h sub f, which is 4 inches, plus 12 inches times 21 inches minus 4 inches. Got an answer for me? 684. 684. 
everybody should be able to do that calculation because everybody brought within their Casio FX 115 ES Plus, right? Or equivalent scientific calculator. Or graphing calculator, I really don't care. Sound good? So therefore, our self weight is gamma times the area. Now, gamma, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot so that I can get my answer in kips per foot um, times 684 square inches. What do I need to do here? Divide by 144, exactly right, because one square foot is equivalent to 144 square inches. <coughs> I remember, like, I think it was when I first started doing this stuff, like it was in chemistry. So what would I do? I'd say, like, 0 0.150 kips per cubic foot, right? And then I'd say, what was it, 684 inches squared, and so if you need to do it this way, that's fine. So that, you know, that and that and so on. However you need to do it. Is that, is chem, I remember doing that in chemistry. Whatever you got to do. Anybody got an answer for me? Say three decimal places. 0. 0.713 kips per foot. There we go. Second? Yes. Yep. There we go. So, remember... This beam is subjected to a dead load of one kip per foot, a live load of two kips per foot, and now a system self weight of 0.713. So since it's all simply supported beams and all uniformly distributed loads, I can say W sub U, So since it's a simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load, WL squared over 8, so I got an answer for me? 13.2. 13 13.2? 13 oh, 263. Say it again? 263. Yeah. tends to be kind of long. I know. Any questions on that? So far so good? Okay. Next couple steps will go kind of fast. Um, I'm going to move. Did everybody, do I need to stay up here for a second? Okay. So step two. So we know how much the section holds up or needs to hold up 
we now compute its required MN. Okay? And so all we're doing here is we're dividing out phi. Now the reason we make this a unique step is because in order to do this we must assume phi is 0.9. So MN required So 263.0 foot kips divided by 0 0.9 and then multiplied by 12 inches per foot because I'm going to want my answer in inch kips for what comes next. And make got an answer? And what is the required moment for the beam? Regardless of if it's a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam, that's going to be the case. In fact, I'd argue that's going to be the case for any beam that you design in concrete design, period. Figure out your load and how much strength you need. Now, next step is to compute the required uh, row value. figuring stuff out. Okay? Remember, we have a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that it's a rectangular T-beam. Okay? So we're going to make that assumption right now. By making that assumption, we can use the following formula. somebody to remind me of something. What is HF? Four inches. Four inches. Just keep that value in mind. Keep that back here. Okay. Start plugging and chugging. So, excuse me. 0 0.85 for KSI over 60. Let's use a bracket. Again, the 1 minus is there twice. It's not a typo. 0 0.85, 4 KSI. Now, which B value do we use here? Six. 60 inches. You're assuming it's a rectangular beam that's 60 inches wide. All right. And what was D? 18 inches. Don't forget to square that. 2 times 3506.7 inch kips. Don't 
Remember, row values are tiny. So let's do like five decimal places. I'm going to tell you, zero point something. Point zero zero three zero nine. Zero zero three zero nine. Do I have a second on that? Yes. Okay. Get comfortable with that equation. That's a long expression, so that's why you know if you're if you're uncomfortable with that, you know, get comfortable with it. So our next step is going to be dealing directly with this assumption. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we assumed it was a rectangular T-beam. If we have a rectangular T-beam, we need this much steel, right? Because that's what rho is. It's a reinforcement ratio. It tells you the percentage of steel that you put in the section. So what I'm now going to do is say, okay, let's say we put this much steel in there. What's A? If we put in that much steel, what would A be? So back calculate. A. And so that would be rho D F Y 0.85 SD prime on the bottom. So again, all I'm doing is taking this, which is A for a rectangular beam, hence why I'm using that, saying AS is rho BD, and just cancel it. That's all I'm doing. for A. Zero point nine eight two. Now first off, what are the units? It's inch it's a dimension, right? So that's inches. Do I have a second on the value? Okay. So A is point nine eight two inches. Now the calculation is easy. Just plug and chug. I want to know what it means. So help me out. What can you tell me about an A value of 0.982 inches? And the hint is to look at the box. H sub F is 4 inches. It is a rectangular T-beam. We assume that it was a rectangular T-beam. And this has verified that. Because remember, here's our beam. And the, so this dimension is 4 inches. And the stress block would only be 0.982 inches. So the stress block is, in fact, rectangular in nature. And so that assumption has been verified. Okay. So what you can say is assumption was valid A less than or equal to HF rectangular TV. So from there all you have to do, and I know we're running short on time, so we'll sort of end the problem after this. From there, all you have to do is compute AS required, which is just rho BD, again using the full width, so 0 0.00309 times 60 inches times 18 inches. And so you get an AS required 
of, I'll go ahead and tell you that, it's 3.34 square inches. So what do you do from there? Well, how wide is the web? Remind me, how wide is the web? 12 inches. Okay, so go here. And say, all right, 3.34. Okay, I don't know, maybe we use six number sevens. Will six number sevens fit? Nope. I don't know. Five number eights, nope. Four number nines, nope. Three number tens, well, three number tens will work. That won't work. There we go, use three number tens, you know. Three number tens will work because it has an area bigger than that. It will fit in a 12 inch width and there's no other option that gives you less steel, right? Analyze your beam. That's it. So what would our answer be? Without further verification, use three number tens, right? There you go. Now, what you could do, you might say, okay, what about, I don't know, eight number sixes, right? Eight number sixes, that has less area, right? It's 3.53, but obviously can't fit eight bars in a single layer, but what about two layers of four bars wide? Maybe that'll work. Let's see. Yeah, I can fit that. Right? That's only, what, 10 and a half inches? So that's another option. So try that. And then what do you do? Go through, actually compute your fee MN, verify that fee equals 0.9, verify that your area of steel is greater than your AS min. That's it. Does that make sense? I hope it does. You have homework on it. All right, what we're going to do next time is this. So we did this one, which was a rectangular T-beam. I don't think it requires an in-depth view into the crystal ball to see that this one's going to be a true T-beam. So this one's going to be a tad more involved. So we're going to do a true T-beam next time. Then we'll look at doubly reinforced sections, if you have steel on the top and the bottom. Um, that's all I have for everybody for today. Um, I will see you all either in a couple minutes or on Mondays. So y'all have a great weekend.